Welcome to Ladies Night. Our unselfish, courageous, creative guest is Gabby Jurgens. More than a military wife, a daughter of a veteran, a mother of a son who served, and so much more. Talking about heroes, Gabby is truly a shero, inspiring and empowering others, serving and supporting those in the military. Creator of the Homefront Girl. Welcome to Ladies Night, Gabby Jurgens. We are so honored to have you here because we always say that we only get the best. So you're the best at what you do because no one no one considers it like you do. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I think you're a Shiro too, all of you, for when you highlight um, women and uh, empowerment and those that are facing a lot of adversity and challenges and overcome them. So thank you for what you do. Oh, yeah, being a former military wife and daughter of a veteran. You know, you created your studio after living the life of over 28 years, the Homefront Collection by the Homefront Girl. It's resonating with those who share and love their hero. You know, and right about now, it's very important to accent and accentuate what you do because you speak of your emotions from firsthand, not something that you interviewed a bunch of people and, or you went into a group and you met these people and you're, you know, overwhelmed. You're, you're it. Yeah, and you're supporting the other heroes and she rose. So tell us exactly a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, it started, um, you know, the daughter of a veteran. Um, I grew up in the life. I raised my son once I was married to a former, um, you know, to a career military officer. Uh, I raised my son in this lifestyle. So I got to see um, what living um, in a military life was like from so many different angles. Um, so when it came to uh, retirement, I was... Um, I was uh, I decided to start the studio because I wanted to do something um, creative. I always knew that I did. I didn't know what it would be, uh, but once I think every woman at some point in their life, uh, especially those who have been mothers and caregivers and have done all things for everyone, um, you find yourself wondering, okay, now what do I do with the rest of my life? Because uh, my son went off to high school. My former husband went off to a new job after he took off the uh, the boots and the camo. And, uh, you know, I was left wondering, uh, because the life that I had known all of my life, the community, um, really wasn't there because we moved to a very uh, rural area for him to start his career. And so for me, those uh, connections were no longer there other than at the end of, a, you know, Facebook or phone or, you know, that those kinds of mediums, which uh, were helpful, but it's not the same as being active and doing things. So... Um, I kept a journal uh, most of my life. Uh, I'm a veteran journal keeper, and I dotted down I d things that I had experienced. And uh, I kind of pulled from that and started uh, creating artwork and designs that I felt depicted this incredibly strong um, group of families and kids and people that support our men and women who serve in our military. And I had never seen it in retail um, in the way that it would introduce to the commercial market or to the civilian community uh, by way of art, which is always, um, I think, I've always believed that art is uh, shines a light um, sometimes in the best way possible. And so um, I started to build a studio and uh, raised a collection of about 900 designs and I had friends who were encouraging me to look for um, an agent to represent me, which was a little difficult. Um, and also, I didn't really have an end goal when I started designing. Um, in many ways, it was just a way to do something. <laughs> um, I tried volunteering and all this other stuff, the things that were usually um, my, uh, my go-to. Uh, but I started to see that I wanted to do something with this. And so I did... Um, sent it out to some agents, and I did get um, an agent in L.A., and they felt that I had a story behind the collection because, as you said, it wasn't just something that I'd been in a group of women and they had inspired me. I am pulling from my own experiences and my own life um, and those things that I had observed uh, raising a, a child in this life 
watching the sacrifices and the emotions of living this life. But I also wanted, um, and, and what they saw was there was a telling of a greater story um, by, um, by creating a brand that was inspirational uh, for both those that are in the military and also those that are looking into the life from the outside. And uh, I think that was sadly lacking in many ways um, because other than, home, you know, welcome home videos or we see them, you know, off on to the planes and deploying and we see the families crying. And, you know, there's not a really a lot, of, um, a lot of knowledge as to what this life is about and the sacrifices that are made. So for me, that was a twofold thing. I am a self-taught artist. I always say that, um, and I make a point when I speak to women's groups because I want them to know that um, there's always a second act in your life. Um, and you don't know what that might be. Uh, for me, I had no idea that it would be this, but um, it wasn't something that um, I, you know, I completely taught myself. So if I can do it, anybody can do it, trust me. Um, so along the way, I've you know, been able to um, connect my collections to uh, some charities that are important to me, like uh, Homes for Our Troops. I did a Yankee Candle collection that benefited uh, them, and uh, they built adaptive mortgage-free homes for our triple amputees. And um, I've done things with a variety of different charities. Uh, currently, I have a candle collection that's available at homefrontgirl.com and pays it forward to United Through Reading which is a wonderful military charity that unites families through separation through the love of reading. Um, so in a nutshell, that's how I started the studio. That was the inspiration I, um, that brought it about. Hello? <laughs> that's Hello? awesome. That is awesome. Oh. I yeah, that's awesome. I put myself on mute. I didn't know uh, if where's mommy. I don't know if we lost mommy activists. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm here. I was just okay. I was unmuting myself because I didn't want to. I was right taking notes at the same time. I didn't want to, you to hear the. You know. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I'm well, here. I'm here. It's but, you know, <laughs> okay. I thought I. I thought I knocked you all out. And you no, were I was listening. No, I, you know, I was listening. This is your interview, and it's very good that you're able to represent yourself. You know, verbally the way you do. You know, looking at all the designs. You know, you have now topping two thousand designs, and your mm -hmm. artwork being very specific to say you're self-taught. Because a lot of people think they are not as good as others because they have don't have these accomplishments of uh, certificates or, or things like exactly, that. And and exactly. what you say so much that resonates with me is second act in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you have something else you could do. It's not you have to concentrate or focus or be specific about one thing and stick to that. And but it's something that you're passionate about that gives you that second life that second look at something, you know, Absolutely. and all the places that you support. And everybody knows the, the Yankee Candle Company. And for you to be able to get something in there, to, you know, with them is a big deal, you know. Yeah, and it, was. It, was. it really is a, a big deal because Yankee, I don't know who doesn't know Yankee Candle, and they are everywhere, you know what I mean, and all the other you know, things that you do and having stuff, products seen in places like Kmart, Walmart, Toys R Us, Amazon, you know, as well as Hallmark and boutiques mm -hmm. around the country. You know, I'm sure that people now are saying, oh, I've seen that. People have supported. Oh, I bought one. You know, because they know in the, the, um, your home front girl teddy bear collection, you know, who doesn't mm -hmm. want that? You know, oh, that's the wonderful. best gift that's yeah. timeless. Because, you know, I have a, I, I don't even know what happened to it now. I, I do know what happened to it, but I had old toys of my own that I kept for a long time till I said, well, I'll let it go. But, you know, a teddy bear is something that you do pass on and you stitch up the corners and you do things and you put another eye or maybe a button for an eye. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. But it's something that, that's a timeless piece that a, the next generation of a child's heart will be captured with it. You know, but I have to ask, you know, you're a military, you know, I don't want to say brat, but you know how they you say military Oh, no, kid. I was an army brat. Absolutely. <laughs> army brat. You got you know, it. <laughs> yeah, you know, an um, army brat. Why didn't you ever join the military? Well, first of all, I'm terrible at taking orders. 
<laughs> but and I would have done something to those uniforms, but <laughs> but um you know, um it's so funny you ask that. Um actually um I much to the chagrin of my mother, <laughs> I actually was a bit of a tomboy. Uh, and I loved going to the motor pool and just hanging out with my, my dad and the soldiers. And, you know, there was always um, – I did a design that said uh, camels. Some girls are born with it in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, you know, in many ways that uh, is exactly what I think happened to me. Um, I have a great love, uh, great memories of – soldiers as I was a young kid and being with my dad and but it wasn't um, you know I, I don't know I never really uh, contemplated that idea but I did have that question recently asked to me um, on an interview um, and it was sort of a, a you know kind of a large sort of a question um, about the fact that only one percent of our military you know is made up you know, only one percent of our population is made up of our military um, and serving, and you know what it, you know what my thoughts were about, um, uh, you know, uh, children or kids or you know, I'm trying to say something here. Uh, going into the military, a lot of uh, uh, mili uh, children raised in the life that don't go into the military and stuff like that. And so the best way that I could answer that, because I do have a lot of friends whose children have gone on to follow in their father's or mother's footsteps and join the military. And my former husband and I always felt that really, um, and I, I truly believe this, when you raise a, li a child in this life, they actually do serve. Um, for 18 years, my son served in, the mili uh, in this military life as a, ch as an, as a military brat. Um, wow. Through the sacrifices and through the things that he, that he did, the changes, the 14 schools, the uh, you know the constant upheaval that is the life that we lead because we, his father, chose to wear the uniform, um, and I fell in love with his father, and then I had you know so I put it that way. Um, so uh, what? Um, and so in many ways, you know, we wanted him to now make that choice as to whatever it is that he chose for his life, and he made that choice as to what he wanted to do. What is so great about uh, raising our children in this life and what I think comes out at the other end is that we um, have children that I had an only child and, you know, the chances of with the chaotic, you know, the, the constant change that this lifestyle is, you, you know, there are chances that he could have been a real introvert, you know, difficult mm -hmm. moving, you know, who, who likes being the new kid in every, new, in every school. I didn't like being the new kid at every base that I had to move to because you leave your friends and all of a sudden you got to start over uh, in a new, new base and make new friends. And, you know, for, all, for, for a military family, it's always that sort of you're the new person and you're constant change. But what the military does do in the community that you have is that it's, you always can depend that you're going to a base and you're going to have the similar things that you had at the other base. So that forms a sort of a cocoon for you that feels, well, this is home, but now I've got to start over. But it, it is a sort of a, a, a bit of a, of, a, of a nest that you feel comfortable in where you're restarting a new assignment and starting over again. Um, so I didn't go in. My son didn't go in. I have friends who are legacy military, meaning that they're, they come from uh, – a long line. Uh, their father served. Now I have friends whose all three kids went on to to serve and are currently serving. I have nephews that are serving in the Marines. Um, so I think it comes down to we want our children to have um, the opportunity to make a choice because I think all of us who've raised children in this life feel that yes, they still they they did sacrifice and they did serve. Um, and I say that now in a lot of my designs when I created the Homefront Baby Collection or the Homefront Kids Collection because I wanted them to see the lifestyle that they live represented in a way that they could go into a, a store and say, hey, that's me. Um, that, that represents who I am. You know, I'm not the right. weirdo kid at the civilian school that, you know, doesn't have a dad who's, or a mom who's ever at the games or anything. It's grandma or grandpa or someone else. Um, it's a... It's, it's a I wanted to see that because I think it's important for them to be able to see that they're also acknowledged. Um, I can tell you a little story here, um, and it meant a lot to me. In 2017, um, 
around Thanksgiving, or before Thanksgiving, a few months before, something came to my attention uh, through, I have no idea, I can't remember even how it happened, but it was uh, the knowledge that a performing arts camp in New York City was giving the, uh, was for the Thanksgiving, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, it was for the ninth appearance that they've had in the parade, that year they were going to uh, focus and have, you know, basically as the stars of the show, military kids performing. And uh, each outfit would be representative of their, of their parents' service branch, whether it was, you know, sailors or, or um, army or whatever it was. They would be performing with these wonderful outfits and all wearing boots. And um, it was an extraordinary thing when I heard about it because our kids never get praised. You know, you sell, you know, neither do the wives. But, um, and I thought, oh, that's a wonderful thing uh, that, you know, they were going to be front and center on Herald Square and the country will see these children performing and showing their pride of service because they also serve. Then I found out that the performing arts camp was taken aback that there was so much of a request. Um, and they did have a financial aid arm for those kids that needed help to be able to pay the fee to go to the performing arts camp and, of course, get to New York. And we're talking about a call went out and an enormous amount of letters came in and uh, um, answers and applications asking for financial aid. And that's what overwhelmed them, that so many children would require a lot of financial uh, support to be able to get to the camp. And so it looked like it was a, it didn't look good. Uh, we're nearing it. And so when I found that out, um, I contact, I, you know, basically I started to say, okay, who's, who can I find out about? Because I wanted to help. Um, there wasn't really anything I could do except open up a Rolodex and I, you know, use my social media to put the word out and say, you know, let's come out and, you know, lend our support and try to get, you know, make a donation to try to get all our kids to New York. Um, because we can't say no to them. We can't say you can't have a parade. It just wasn't going to, I just couldn't imagine that happening. Um, it was about 130 kids, I think, at the final count. And so I did connect up with a Marine wife, former Marine wife, who was an advisor on the Performing Arts uh, Camp uh, Advisory Board. And her and I, I just left her a message, and I just said who I was and said, I'm not a kook. <laughs> you can Google me. <laughs> I'm okay. Um, but I'm a former wife. Can, what can I do to help? I can use, you know, I, I'll put the word out. I'll, you know, whatever I can do, let me, you know, just let me know. And she called me like within 10 minutes and we hit it off and we're the best of friends to this day. Um, and um, so we got to going, you know, I basically found out exactly what I needed to know. They were generous enough when I connected up with the Performing Arts Camp, which is Camp Broadway, um, the head of the the camp and the performing arts. It's, it's very well known in New York. It's, a, it's really exemplary. They do an incredible job for our children. And by the way, my child was never really an athlete, you know, like in, as we moved around. You know, sports wasn't his thing. Performing arts was his thing. So my, right. my son, that was the way he could connect as we moved from base to base, was through the performing arts, was getting on, his, you know, performing at theater and doing things like that. So... I knew the importance of something like this for these kids to, you know, to go to something so different from coming from all over the country. I mean, we're talking about, we had one gold star kid who was, who was part of the, the group that wanted to go. And, uh, and a gold star kid is someone whose parent has been killed in the line of that, in the line of, of, of battle. So, mm -hmm. um, so when I heard about, so anyway, uh, I put out my Rolodex, I twisted arms, I, annoyed people. <laughs> um, and I put it out on social media constantly, constantly. And um, I, I plugged it and plugged it. And so did a lot of other people. And I was very grateful to a lot of my military friends who opened up their, their uh, checkbook and started signing off checks and sending them off. And uh, we got the news that our kids made it. And, you know, one of the things I was going to share is the Camp Broadway was generous enough to share with me the application. And I got to read what these children said as to why they wanted to be a part and why they wanted to represent their families and wow. their service, the service of their families. And I swear, I mean, I was like, Ugh, you know, tears are coming out. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, so all the kids made it, and they made it to the camp. And then I was 
very generously, Camp Broadway actually invited uh, Miji and uh, who was the Marine wife and uh, and me to to join the families on at Thanksgiving Day Parade. You know, to join them as they watched it and everything. So I flew to New York and um, I gifted all the children. I made sure they didn't know they were going to get this. But on the night before the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they did a rehearsal at the hotel, this huge ballroom, and they had a star to, you know, mimic the star on Herald Square in front of Macy's, that they would be, you know, that's where they stopped to do the performance and do the, the song. And uh, we had a performance, a uh, pre-performance, and that night, and it was really amazing. I just moved you to tears. These kids were like, I think they learned all of these steps within like maybe four weeks or three weeks. And, uh, and all I did was look out. And the thing was amazing is, you know, I did have about 130 teddy bears shipped to, ne- to, ne- to the hotel and along with bags that said, I share my hero with the world. And um, they didn't know they were going to get them. My son, I have one son, and he was, uh, he was currently in school. He's getting his master's in L.A. And he uh, had flown to New York to visit some friends because he had been living in New York after he graduated from college and had been working at HBO. So he had flown there. So he was going to take the train to where uh, I live here in Rhode Island. And um, he called me, and he thought he was just going to get a home-cooked, you know, Thanksgiving dinner from mm-hmm. Mom. <laughs> and I had to tell him, I, he said, okay, Mom, I'm coming in. Uh, I'm going to arrive at this time. And I said, uh, well, you know what, son? Why don't you just stay in New York? Because I'm going to New York, too for Thanksgiving, and I'm involved with the Macy's Parade, and they've invited me, and he, mm-hmm. the, the thing always cracks me up with my son, he goes, Mom, now what have you done? <laughs> I was <just> like, well, <laughs> he said, now who are you rescuing, and what are you doing? And I was like, well, you know, and uh, so the cool thing about this was, and this is the thing that amazed me, is when I got the chance to, you know, and they introduced me that night, and I got up, and I saw the kids, and they were all sitting. And, and you can see the photos. They're all on my website. Uh, this big photograph of these children. I'm like the little I'm, – I'm wearing like a turtleneck dress. It's, a, it's black, and everyone else is in their beautiful costumes. So I'm like this little black dot in the center. And that's, yeah. But everyone else is like in <laughs> red, white, and blue. But, um, and they're all holding their teddy bears. But before I presented Teddy Bears, they introduced me, and they said, this is the, home, you know, this is the creator of Hump Art Girl. And a lot of the parents had come up to me and hugged me and said, thank you for putting the word out. We've been following you. We couldn't have been able to do this uh, without the word getting out as much as it did. But I do want to say I was not the only person that did this. This was not my mm-hmm. – I didn't get the kids there on my own. There was a, it was a concerted effort. I just simply, you know, said, let me help. Um, so I got up, and I dragged my – 26-year-old son at the time who just was like, oh, good Lord, here comes my mother. <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, and I got to tell you, my son, he is one good-looking kid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he looks like all hipster coming out of L.A. He's at, you know, getting his master's and producing. He's in Hollywood and all that. And so he stood up. But um, I brought him up and I ended, I said, hi, you know, it's really an honor. You guys were great. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. And I said, well, i got to tell you something. You know, I was an Army brat, and here's my son, and he was an Army brat. And I said, um, he used to be like all of you sitting here. You know, he loved performing, and, you know, he traveled all over. He had, you know, all these schools that he went to. And guess where he's at now? You know, my son, of course, raises his hand and just waves. <laughs> it's like, you know, right. uh, and, uh, you know, these kids are all looking up at him like he's Brad Pitt, you know. Yeah. And I think he's in Hollywood, he's in Hollywood now, and he's learning. Wow. To, he's getting his master's in producing, uh, and he wants to produce films. And I said, but guess what? He started just like you guys, so you could, you could do this too. There's nothing right. that can stop you from doing what you want to do. And so we have a little surprise for you. And so then all of the, the Broadway staff comes out, and they bring these big bags of teddy bears. I mean, they were just clear mm-hmm. bags, and all the teddies were mm-hmm. in there. And so my son and I grab them, and then, you know, it could have gone like, okay, everybody come up, and I'll give you a teddy bear. No, we right. just threw them up in the air, and all the kids just jumped up and were grabbing That was the exciting bears. for them. Yeah. Oh, it was so fun. They were having such yeah. a ball, and then, of course, they were trading. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. one wanted the soldier, one wanted the, you know, the other one. And, right. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. And then we have that big picture that was taken. And then the next day we watched them perform on Herald Square. And uh, my son and I, 
had Thanksgiving dinner with the family um, who were watching it from these big screen TVs because a lot of them, you know, it would have been very difficult to follow their children in a, like 4 million people that line, right. you know, New York City. Right. So um, mm-hmm. it was really, it was really, uh, it, was a, it was an extraordinary experience for me. Um, but it also shows you, um, you know, what can happen when you're, when you really, um, you know, I, I, I will honestly say I never imagined that this little studio that I started would be something that um, would touch people's lives in this way. I know it touched my life in the sense that I, I am so inspired by uh, first responders. I'm inspired by those that are giving back to their community. I'm inspired by mm-hmm. those that are uh, serving our nation. So to me, that's what fuels a lot of my designs. Um, and to see their children and... Uh, see them recognized is exactly why I started Homefront Kids. I wanted to put that into a design and put it in a retail market so that they can see their lives reflected that way as well. And, again, I did that with Homefront Babies. And, you know, I have the Homefront Pet line that I'm trying to get licensed. So there's a couple of, you know, I'm still opening the doors. It's not easy for my studio because it is a new thing. Nobody ever looked at us. You know, we were just sort of the silent ranks out there. Uh, so in, in uh, retail, it's sort of, um, it's a large demographic when you think about it. It's 25 million, and uh, we've been in a decade of war, and that's 5 million caregivers. Um, and so it's an extraordinary market, and it's still very much a struggle to get manufacturers to actually look at the collections and say, we want to we put this out to market. So I'm still you know, working Gabby, on that quite. You, talk, you, you know, Gabby, you speak so much of what you've done for others, and you are quite an inspiration. If anyone would just take the time to, I want to say, go to your site or just even to Google you and for the information to come up and to be able to see your interviews and things like that. But you don't talk about your struggle. And you have such a respect for, I want to say, the red, white, and blue always talk about what you did. You know, in interviews you do, talk about what you did for others and everything, but people don't know your struggle. And, you know, I know you have such a a great respect and uh, admiration for the military and things that they go through, especially the wives, and because you have a son, so firsthand, another firsthand experience with raising a child, you know. But you don't talk about your peak. You know, it says on here, your red, white, and blue ribbons turned pink in 2016. And this is probably the, the hardest challenge that any woman could, I want to say, perceive or even go through. You want to share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, I, it, the cancer, what, it, what happened was I was married for, I was, Happily, you know, like a lot of women, they think they're happily married. I thought I was happily married. Um, but um, uh, we moved to find our forever home to this beautiful place that I live in now. And um, fortunately, um, I uh, received, um, you know, it, it quickly spiraled uh, unexpected. I didn't know. I just came home to a house that was empty. Uh, my, my marriage was over, apparently. And uh, that sent me into a very... Um, uh, downward spiral health-wise. I was in shock. It was sort of a um, PTSD sort of situation. Um, it, it was unexpected. In a million years, I would have imagined this would have, it would have harmed a hair on my head. And uh, so that caused um, an enormous amount of stress. And I had passed a mammo not too long before that. This was... Um, at the end of 2015 when this all happened to me. Um, and again, it was a shock. It was an absolute stellar shock. And this was my best friend. So uh, my life up until then has been, you know, I had this entire um, life in the military with my um, career husband and, and had, a, you know, been very proud and, you know, started over and I thought we were, anyway, uh, it just didn't turn out that way. But what ended up happening because stress, will give you an illness. So I do say that to all of our ladies out there. Please take care of your health and understand that um, for me it, was a, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't even conscious. It was just something that hit me. And um, it just was, I was numb for a very long time. And uh, in the space of, it happened on October 7th. Uh, and by March, um, March, middle of March, 
of 2016, I was I received the news that I had I had a fast growing cancer and it was now at stage three, um, and that I had to get to uh, treatment as soon as possible. Um, so I fought this for 19 months without um, without my husband, <laughs> without the support that I thought I would have had. But, but, you know, that's what happened. But I did have my military family who did step into the gap and did help me, um, um, gave me a place to stay, uh, helped me with my dogs. Um, you know, life turned on its head. Um, it was uh, very difficult in so many ways because at the same time, uh, when someone says cancer, that's pretty heady, you know, um, and when they tell you that it's at stage three and you, you know, sort of after everything that had just happened to me, I remember looking at my doctor and saying, now I have cancer <laughs> um, in complete shock. And, you know, she had tears in her eyes because she knew already what I was dealing with. Um, so I went and um, it was very difficult. I had some of the most um, aggressive uh, chemotherapy uh, for 19 weeks, and then I had uh, the mis- you know I went into surgery, um, and at the same time I had to come back and forth, back and forth uh, to deal with uh, divorce and uh, constant you know things that were being filed um, and stuff, and it was so the stress was never ending, uh, but it was on a medical hold because I was fighting for my life, so. Um, mm-hmm. I did ring my bell in April of uh, 2017. That meant my treatment was over. You ring your bell when your treatment is done. And Mm -hmm. I was there with friends and family, and I rang my bell. And uh, I came back to what should have been a happy place. (laughs) It is a happy place. But I came back to face uh, divorce. Uh, So that was uh, what I had to face. And I hadn't seen him in 19 months. Uh, So it was difficult, a lot of that. for me, it was, um, I don't know if you, uh, well, one of my favorite films is Waiting to Exhale. And in a lot of ways, I, I, I actually was waiting to exhale. I was right. waiting to, I think my breath had stopped uh, October 7th of 2015. Um, and then finally, when it was over, and uh, it was over, and the, you know, the divorce was over, I just walked out of the courtroom with my friend, and uh, I didn't look back, didn't not look back at him did not look back at all. I just walked out and I just exhaled. And I felt like I had no idea how, what my future held. It was not a great divorce, you know. Um, I now had to take care of, you know, figure out that second act for my life. The studio mm-hmm. that I had started was something that really was couched probably, and I can certainly say this honestly, um, in the comfort of, of, of a marriage, you know, where I felt okay, this was something I could start. Now it was something that I needed to really get going. Um, and so my focus went to that. Uh, but I will tell you that as I was going back and forth to, to treatment, I mean, I, I was living in, um, in, uh, in D.C., and my treatment was in D.C. and Baltimore. But I was staying with friends, um, and friends helped me with my dogs. But I traveled with my big old 27-inch iMac because I wanted to keep um, up with my contracts and, and uh, it was a focus for me. Um, so I went to chemo. I came back. I sat down in front of the computer, and I just went, went to work, and, um, and that helped tremendously. Um, and it wasn't easy. You know, uh, chemo's not great. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, was, I still have some of the remnants of, you know, of treatment, as most of us who've gone through uh, breast cancer and treatment will be left with re- residual, uh, you know, after effects because what is going to save you is also uh, will have, uh, you know, effects on your body. And right. so that's still there. But thankfully and thank God I am doing uh, well. I go into surgery um, the, this month for another surgery uh, for reconstruction. I was ill a lot, um, so a lot of things have been delayed, if you can believe it. It's just like it. I can't wait for all of this to be over. I've been through so many surgeries, but... Um, I'm doing better, um, and um, I have also what I wanted to do, and I knew this at some point, that I wanted to be able to in some way create a collection that was an affirmation of what a battle with cancer is like for a woman. And what I did was create a collection called When the World Turned Pink, which was the name of my chemo journal. Um, right. When the World Turned Pink, 
hashtag you fight. And I pulled from that to create the collection. I didn't know what, how it was going to look. I knew I didn't want it to be, you know, my boobies are pink, almost killed me or something. Right. You know, I didn't want to do it yeah. like that. I wanted it to be what I relied on, things that I yeah. uh, really, really did rely on and were very personal to me. So a lot of the, I created the collection and um, a lot of the affirmations that are on these beautiful pink t-shirts mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. um, things like, um, never in my story will it read, I quit. Um, right. or, or, or I think, uh, and then one that is very emotional to me because it was a personal experience is uh, one that says, uh, will today be the day that you see me? I'm more than cancer. Because that mm -hmm. happened to me a lot. Um, right. People, you know, we call it look away. They basically mm -hmm. don't really want to see your eyes. They don't want to look because they know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, something along those lines. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> That was um, fine. You know, I used to do look good, feel better for cancer survivors or people that were going through chemo and I would go to the hospital. And because of my background in cosmetology, I would bring my clippers and shears and I would bring scarves. You know, I had I used to sew and so I had all I would make cut out forty five like a, a a square so that people right. would have like scarves to make on their hair, silky things to put, you know, on their head and show them how to uh, cut the wigs and a lot of things. So I know that these things are, the little things are very important, but what you see is very important because people know that you're sick and they know, they can imagine, the ones that haven't been through it can imagine, you know, how hard it is, but they want you to look good anyway. And you want to look good. And you want to and, look good. I mean, that's yeah. absolutely true. I didn't want to right. be the face of, uh, of, of um, I think for me, um, I had a friend also too, his cosmetologist, um, who actually gave me some tips because when the second chemo rolled around, I was, well, mm -hmm. what I did is prior to starting and prior to having the port installed in me, uh, which mm -hmm. was to give, you know, I, my, I would receive the chemo to report in my chest. Um, I went with a friend and I did the GI Jane. I just and my hair was long. I said just right. took it all off, and um, because I really could not, I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to go through all of that, you know, where the hair right. comes out. And I, you know, I just and the I knew hair, myself. Right? Yeah, I just yeah. didn't want to. So I was kind of uh, my hair was pretty short, and uh, but regardless, I still had the lumpy the lumps that would come out at, because at the second chemo, I'd been told at this point you're going to start seeing it. It's going to fall. And then mm -hmm. it's not just your hair on your head. You're going to lose your eyelashes, your eyebrows. Right, eyebrows, It's yeah. all gone. And, um, you know, you're just like this vacant face. And, um, mm -hmm. and when I saw it, you know, so I, I decided for myself, I think probably, that I wanted to put my best face forward in saying, you know, I'm not going to let this change my life completely, completely, where... Right. Every time I looked in the mirror, I would see this person uh, that was the face of cancer and struggling, and and it was a choice that I made. So I learned all those little tips, and it's amazing what can happen with makeup. I love makeup. <laughs> I mean, and to see your really picture, beautiful. it's a beautiful picture with your hair shaved down. You know, it's a beautiful picture. Right, that's what Look Good Feel Better is about. They had the finest of makeup that you could, you know, that you had in a one shopping bag, and it had everything yeah. you could use. So you take your time, and you, even in your saddest time, there was something you could do to lift yourself, and that was your Right, look. exactly. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. being able to see and uh, I put that face forward, and, and uh, I think that helped tremendously. I think there's a lot of uh, – we did that one photograph that you see with uh, – the sh my hair is gone, and, mm -hmm. and it, was, uh, it was called The Girl in the Mirror. And it was just mm -hmm. for us to be able to face, you know, who this – and um, – I mean, I have the other photos, which, of course, show me, like, completely. Uh, and when I look back at that, I always just, I am, I'm astonished at how far this journey has been. Um, but also, too, I think, uh, as you said, you know, I did see a lot of amazing volunteers and survivors that return. And as I was sitting at the chemo bay and, uh, or infusion center, and I saw them come in and give hope in, in, in the way that, um, by talking to them, making them laugh, uh, making them concentrate as they were having, you know, this very deadly drug being pumped into you, hoping for right. it to help you, um, it, it, it distracted them. So 
so in creating the collection, what I wanted to do is I know that I wanted to attach it to some, to give back to some, uh, somewhat, some, some organization that I knew I had really, to be honest, had really made an impression on me when I went. I hadn't started my treatment yet. I was still, you know, I was rail thin and I was still, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, shaking from everything that was going on, that I was now facing this, that I didn't have my best friend. I, all of it was just extraordinary, enormous. My mother, right. who's 80, 82, was uh, going through the shock of learning that, you know, all that had mm -hmm. happened, and mm -hmm. now her daughter had cancer. And, you know, that was stressful for me to worry about, what, because she was uh, in Colorado. and I, So it was, a, it was a lot. But I remember going to this fundraiser for cancer, and a friend had taken me. He was also a survivor. And I listened to uh, Dr. Brem of the Brem Foundation. And she spoke, her daughter spoke, uh, they spoke about what the Brem Foundation does. And it is a, a sort of a local uh, charity there within the uh, D.C. metro area, Baltimore and everything. And she worked mm -hmm. at Johns Hopkins. And she right. had this in her family. And so when I heard her tell the tale of, See, what she would do is she worked at Johns Hopkins. She tested uh, breast cancer imaging, you know, to detect cancer, early detection, to stop mm -hmm. it before it spread. And right. um, on one night when she was at uh, the hospital, she was testing an equipment. She found her own cancer up on that screen. And mm -hmm. it just made it, I couldn't imagine what that must have been like for her to look up and see her, her own cancer there. And... Um, this woman was so inspirational in all the things that she does and her daughters who, of course, you know, again, they had the BRAC uh, in their family and the decisions that they made for their treatment. But then to take that one step further and say, okay, we need early detection, especially in areas where this may not be something that is known in neighborhoods or women have access to. Or So that's why I decided and I contacted Bram and I said, I created this collection I've met Dr. Bram. She inspired me when I started my fight. So for every purchase of a shirt uh, from the collection, which is available at homefrontgirl.com, I will donate $5 to the Bram Foundation to help them in their early detection. Um, and also, what I would also, I would also add is that one of the things that they do, which I'm very, I wish I could be there to actually volunteer hands-on and be in the area to help, but I think it's extraordinary that they came up with this, is that, you know, bras are a big deal, um, right. and uh, especially when you're going through, you know, a loss of a body part, uh, mm -hmm. as you do. Uh, it's so psychological in so many ways, um, but they have done this collection of uh, donations of bras, all different sizes, all of, you know, and what they do is they have an arrangement with these cleaners that have volunteered their services to clean all of them, tag them, mm -hmm. and then they set it up and they have where you can, women can come in and find bras that would fit them and adjust and, and, and to this new light, new you right. that you have, or before you even start or after you start and you have your implants and things. So uh, that drive alone, I, I, I spoke to uh, one of uh, one of the uh, coordinators at Brown and I said, you know, I think that's extraordinary you guys are doing that. That's and you're doing it in a way that it's not like, oh, here's a handout. Here's a beautiful way to find yourself something for yourself. And it's done in mm -hmm. such a, you know, because all of this is about uh, respect and dignity. Um, because so much of you is lost in this battle. Because you're out of, you, you lose control. Suddenly, everyone else is in control um, about what your treat. you know. I mean, you make decisions about whether you decide to have a treatment or not. But as you've got no control over that chemo going into you and fighting all of those cancer cells and destroying them. You know, you're just hoping and praying that it's going to take place. And I remember the morning I woke up after ringing my bell and I didn't have a calendar that told me where to be, who to see, what to do. Mm -hmm. And my, and I had been doing it for 19 months and it, it was scary. It was like, okay, now what, do, oh, I know what I had to do. I had to go, go to court when I got back. Mm -hmm. Yippee for Gabby. Um, so, uh, but after that, you know, uh, you know, I've just kind of plugged along, and I'm working now to um, one of the things I discovered while I was going through this uh, horrible time in my life um, was that I had lost my health insurance once the divorce right. was final. I would right. get one year. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that was kind of a shocker. Yeah, um, and it's something that, um, as I found out, I said, okay, I'm seeing my senator. So I had a friend who was uh, a military wife of 18 years. And I tell mm-hmm. you the years because they be, are very important to the to the, the cause this cause. Right. Um, she has 18 years. I was missing one year. I had 19 years. The threshold to keep all of your benefits for military spouses in a divorce is that you have 20 years of that service member's active duty mm-hmm. within your married mm-hmm. life. I was missing one year. So basically, I was there for 90 percent of his career. You know, right, uh, right. but doesn't matter. Um, so I went to the Senate. I met with my senator. I met with a senior legislative aide at the uh, at the Armed Services Committee, and this is where a lot of the stuff takes place, where these decisions are made. And she, my friend, went with her little bag of awards that she'd received over the time when her husband was active in the military. And she has a debilitating disease. Uh, she has to go in for back uh, shots, and her hands uh, have a have a, a, a I can't remember the name of it, but um, life wouldn't, you know. She needs health care. So what she, we sat down, and, and I talked to them, and I explained to them. I said, look, I, I know it's too late for me. I'm not divorced yet, but I know I knew that there was no way that um, it's going to happen in my time. My And I, it, I can't be grandfathered, but I said, you guys have to make this right. This is wrong. The, uh, right. You do not leave these women behind who have been given so much of their lives to support the mission of the military and then right. at the worst moment in their life, they find out that because they're missing up to one day, you're going to take away their benefits. While if you have 20, 20, 20, and I am very happy for many of my friends that do have it, that made the cut, they keep it all, you know. So for us. But we'll also another it. thing to include in that, they have to stay unmarried. Because yes, once they, they marry, don't they lose their benefits, period. So they have no benefits. They lose so it. They, can't. they lose their yeah, but then right. it gets reinstated if they divorce or the person that they marry dies. It will get reinstated. Mhm. Mhm. So that's a good thing, you know. But unfortunately, for those of us who don't make the cut, because of three, let's say I have 19 years, 364 days, but I'm missing that one day. Wow. I lose it all. So to say that to someone, and especially when you think about it, when you put it in this context, think about the decade of war we've been in. They have come Mm -hmm. back, and many of these spouses, both female and male, have had to deal with war-torn homes with their children, Mm -hmm. where PTSD or PTS, uh, what is it, post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress stress disorder, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but now they're calling it syndrome, not the disorder. But anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, but they've had to deal with this, the night terrors, the, the, the being there for their caregivers as caregivers for their military family members and dealing with their own therapy that they need in order to cope and keep a family together in the in the the dregs of what happens in the aftermath of service in a war. And now, let's say it ends in a divorce and it's gone. Now you're telling them, by the way, you don't have health insurance. You're going to have to go figure it out on your own. Now, I have come, I have started a petition, and it is available at homefrontgirl.com, and I encourage your listeners to please Please give us your support uh, to the women out there who are fighting um, very difficult times. Um, and we're trying to great, gain the attention of uh, those who can make this decision and fix this oversight because I believe and I want to believe that this is an oversight. Um, sign the petition. Uh, and I will, you know, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for supporting uh, these spouses. But I will tell you that I have heard in the last couple of weeks uh, as the petition has come out and it's been shared among many military uh, spouse uh, blogs and things like that. And, you know, one of the things that I have taken away from that, and I and I do, you know, I, I'm that's fine, you know, I have been come the lightning rod <laughs> for a lot of these spouses who just think that we're, you know, oh, get over it, get your big girl panties on and just deal with it. Right. <laughs> you know, I have heard so much. And all I can think of is there but for the grace of God go I. You know, a lot of these spouses mm-hmm. will say, well, if I was to valueize it, but you, you know, they don't, what they don't, what they fail to understand, first of all, they fail greatly in the, in the sense of empathy because mm-hmm. they have no idea what some right. of the, the, these situations are like for so many of these spouses uh, who right. are dealing with this. Um, but on the other hand, too, the idea that this is some sense of entitlement, you can't equate mm-hmm. the 
first of all, the military is already giving this to military spouses who meet the 20 rule. So what do you mm-hmm. say to those spouses who get to keep their benefits? Do you call them entitled? Do you call them right. um, whatever, what was one word, mooch? <laughs> um, hmm. What do you say to those spouses? Because they get to keep it. But yet, in a petition where we're asking that fairness be issued uh, in a sliding rule here, to those that fail to meet this criteria that the military, and by the way, the military at one time had it at 10 years that for you to qualify. And then mm-hmm. I'm sure it was fiscal for fiscal reasons, they changed it. But the ignorance in so many ways of not looking into this issue, but also the harshness that uh, some, of, some of these spouses, and again, I love my sisterhood. Boy, I feel the sisterly love coming across the <laughs> social media right now. <laughs> but mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. okay. That's okay. Go ahead. You know, you just go ahead and beat me up. It doesn't matter, really. Uh, what, as long as we get the signatures and as long as we get the word out, that's all that matters because the bottom line is to get this fixed for people like my friend who has who brought in her little award, her awards and said, at one time you considered me incredibly indispensable. And now, when something that's out of my control in many ways happens, you basically are telling me that I'm no longer essential. And um, what I have sacrificed and given up, um, and again, some of the arguments have been, well, you didn't have to give it up. Well, you didn't have to do that. Blah, 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 blah. You know, well, you know, it's great for you to be uh, 2020, <laughs> you know. Uh, right. You don't know each person's life and what they had to face or the reasons that they made the reasons. And so... That's why we don't, um, we don't apply those rules to something like this. We apply the rule as a fairness thing uh, because we understand the life that, these, that, that we, when you marry into a service life, uh, it requires extraordinary amounts of sacrifice on behalf of the families. Um, so, um, you know, I'm hoping that the petition will gain the attention of those who can make uh, a difference, and so I have gone out and become a mil- you know sort of an advocate for this, um, and speaking uh, spoken out about it. I hope to continue to speak out about it. Hope nobody comes finds me in my home and <laughs> pickets me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, this will, this will be the moment, guys. Where my son would probably say, "Mom, what have you done now?" <laughs> right <So> again. <laughs> uh, yeah, this will be where my son says, "What are you doing now, mother? Like you don't have enough problems." You know, uh, but, you know, what I've learned, if anything, is I walked away from the humiliation of walking those steps at the Senate and hearing that nothing could be done and knowing that uh, my ex was not going to legally separate in order for me to keep my benefits. That was not an option. Um, And that um, I walked around from treatment to treatment with the thought, now what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I get one year. That's all they give you. Uh, and then after that, you're on your own. And now I have this disease that I require medication and treatment. And what, at this point, how do I make it happen, you know? Um, and so that was something that I said to myself, if I survive this and I make it through this, I will never let another woman go through this who has been and lived the life that I did. Um, and I just, and that was, a, that, that, that was the, the sort of the commitment I made. Uh, to myself because I didn't want, uh, I had been humiliated enough, you know, right. over everything that had happened in my life with my marriage. And I was like, this on top of it was just like, you're just piling on now. Um, and I know that my story is not as bad as so many other stories that I've heard since coming out with the petition and talking about it. And I give so much um, uh, just praise and prayer to so many women who are going through such horrible situations when life, the bottom just falls out from under you when you didn't expect it. Um, right. and, and yes, it happens in civilian life. I always feel like I have to, you know, when I say that, I, I, I'm reading all the things that I've read, you know, sort of like when I answer yeah. them. Yeah, I yeah. know it happens in civilian, but you have, you know, but the thing is, understand the, 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 the differences that are in this particular life. Um, right the loneliness that comes with this life. And, you know, saying get your big girl fatigue, you know, panties on or, or making light of it 
you know, uh, or get over yourself. But you have girl. your big girl panties on. You I have got to let my them big know. girl panties. You have your big girl panties yeah, on. Yeah, and they're pink. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know. And, and you've had them on them. for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've so, had them um, on for a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's just, uh, and I always, you know, and I think the thing that I walked away from in so many ways, through the last couple of years of struggles and um, has been how great empathy is in life and how great right. it is to really praise that um, because it truly makes us, um, if we don't have that, if we can't empathize uh, with another struggle, um, that, makes, that diminishes all of us in so many ways. Right. So right. that has been something that um, I think I took away very much so. This is so wonderful. Tori, you got anything? Um, I just want to commend her. Um, basically, she looks like she got it all together right now, and all she needs is those little small assistance from everyone, you know, that wants mm-hmm. to be involved. Um, it's, it's just a blessing to have people that actually can put things in perspective and move on them. So definitely I commend you for all of your work and the work you're going to be doing in the future because I got a feeling you're the type of person that doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah, my son Not would say all. that. <laughs> Not at all. I know, my son, my poor son. <laughs> So thank um, you for all your endeavors and everything oh, that you're doing. And uh, please – Give us your um, your contacts or your social media so people can follow you uh, and know how to get in contact with you. Wonderful. I so appreciate it. Yes. Uh, well, the website is uh, www.homefrontgirl.com. And um, all of my social media, um, I'm on Instagram, um, a, uh, Homefront Girl. Um, on Twitter, a, a Homefront Girl. And um, – you know, you can write to me, Gabby, at homefrontgirl.com. Um, and um, thank you for your support uh, and for what you guys all do and putting, shining the light on so many inspirational people. I count myself very humble and lucky to have been on your show. So thank you. And I will thank post you. up on, on my show and stuff to, to sign the petition, the, the one that you have on change.org, because people don't realize that's a important thing, and also it is important if change.org accepts it. You don't just put it in and say you're going to do this. You know, change.org does have to accept it. And it says change military rule, leaving military spouses with no health care in a divorce. And it starts with imagine, and this is what I'll close with. Powerful words, but just for a moment, do just that. You fall in love with a service member and become a part of the military community. Your life, because you feel you fell in love with someone who wears a country's uniform, changes forever. This is a life of service, dedication, and countless sacrifices over the years. And you, you, you know, you exemplify dedication. Because, because of your dedication and your lifelong willingness to be of service to someone of service tells a big story. And everything that, you, that I brought out and you detailed and that you reminded us of is inspiration to everyone to do what you have to do and things that you can get done if you put your mind to it and you focus. But you didn't focus on yourself as much as you focused on everything else. So people need to just imagine to be able to do one of the things you did, if not all of the things that you did. There's something in there for everyone. And so this has been Gabby Jurgens, the Homefront Girl, founder and leader of the Homefront Girl. And as your hat says on there, I got this, and you indeed do. So you have the powerful Tori Jones of Power 904 and Mommy Activist, the dynamic duo, back again with Ladies Night. And thank you so much, Gabby Jurgens, for sharing yourself. You are the home front girl. Thank you oh, very thank much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, you have a wonderful, blessed day. <laughs> <laughs>